Good afternoon, everyone. It is one minute past the hour, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Kelly Hughes. I'm one of the project officers on the PMHCA team. Um, and I wanna thank you um, on behalf of HRSA um, for joining uh, the third uh, HRSA MCHB Evaluation Capacity Building Webinar. Um, on um, For today's agenda, we'll be sharing some updates from the PMHCA team as well as the MDRBD um, team. And then JBS will introduce the webinar topics of expanding programs to new populations and settings. You'll also hear from uh, John Strauss, who will discuss expansion of behavioral health access programs, and from the Massachusetts PMHCA uh, program about how they are expanding their programs to new populations and settings. Before the webinar ends, uh, there will be an opportunity for program to program discussion around this topic. So feel free to enter your questions in the chat or save them towards the end. Um, and so with that, I am going to turn it over to Susan Hayashi from JBS. Thanks. Start talking. There you go. Uh, thank you so much, Kelly. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone today. I'm Susan Hayashi, and I'm from JBS. I'm the project director for the HRSA MCHB evaluation contract. We're happy to have you join us today for the third evaluation capacity building webinar that will be held in this project year, um, which ends in September for us, and there'll be one more um, webinar in August. Before I get started, I'll do our usual housekeeping here. And and uh, with some of the webinar logistics. For the roll call, please enter your state and the program name. So for example, uh, Maryland uh, PMHCA. Um, so we can uh, take attendance here. At the end of today's presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. Please hold all questions regarding presentations until the end. When it is time for Q&A, please use the raise your hand feature and we will unmute you so you can ask your question. You can also type your questions into the chat box and um, you can put those throughout the meeting as well. And sometimes we're able to address those uh, at the same time. So um, as, as the presentation is going on. If you're having any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box for assistance. Please type your question into the chat box and push send. We will assist you as soon as possible. Today's meeting will be recorded. Once the recording is available, a download link will be provided to all the wordies. I'll now turn it over to Madhavi to provide HRSA PMHCA updates. Then Mona Lee will provide MDRBD updates. So thank you, Madhavi. Okay, um, thank you so much, Susan and Kelly. Um, welcome to all of the PMHC and MDRBD um, awardees who are on the webinar today. I'm just going to take a, a few minutes to give um, some quick um, So as you can see by the slide, um, PA, PMHCA reauthorization um, is complete. Um, we, um, the legislative authority for PMHCA was reauthorized through this uh, bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Um, and so we have that language. It looks pretty similar to um, previous iterations of the legislative authority for PMHCA. There's um, you know, a couple of provisions um, in there, um, one related to programs working with schools and EDs and, and also call, um, a reference to developmental behavioral pediatricians um, as being uh, potentially being members of a PMHCA team. Um, that language was in previous iterations of the NOFO, but um, it was added um, specifically to the, um, the reauthorization language. So, um, so we're looking at, um, you know, the, uh, some of those additions to the legislative authority to see how we'll incorporate them into upcoming NOFOs, notice of funding opportunities. Um, you know, we, um, because uh, with reauthorization, we will, we anticipate having a um, funding opportunity um, come out early next year, you know, so that we can have a, um, a uh, funding opportunity in fiscal year 23. Um, we'll talk more about that at a later date, but, um, you know, for the 2018 and 2019 awardees, you know, or who are um, in year the last year of their period of performance or who are going into their last year of the period of performance, um, you know, another competition is probably 
um, good news to you all. So, um, so we'll provide more information about that. There's also um, some language in the reauthorization or the legislative authority through reauthorization about additional funds uh, for the program um, for the next um, period of performance. So we're also looking at um, ways that um, we'll be able to use those additional funds. So just stay tuned for more information as we go along about that. Um, I also wanna just talk briefly about the 60 day federal register notice on survey instruments that it's out now. Um, comments are due no later than um, September 6th. Um, Katie Gaynor from our team sent an email to the listserv on 7-7 about um, the 60 day FRN being open for comments. And I believe uh, Mona Lee shared the same or similar announcement with the MDRBD awardees about the open comment period. Um, so as you're, you know, if you're considering providing comments on um, the instruments, just, you know, make sure that you um, um, look at it with the lens of these four questions. Um, the necessity and utility of the proposed information collection for the, um, for the evaluation, the accuracy of the estimated uh, burden, time burden that was listed in the um, FRN, um, ways to enhance the quality, utility, and clarity of the information to be collected, and the use of automated collection techniques um, to minimize information collection uh, burden. So those are the four questions um, that you should keep in mind if you're interested in uh, responding to that FRN. Um, just one quick thing about the raw data files. I know we've mentioned um, on previous webinars that we um, we'll share um, raw data files um, on the healthcare provider practice level and program implementation survey data. Um, we are looking to um, share uh, fall 2020 data files with 2018 and 2019 PMHCA awardees um, in July uh, this month, probably later this month or early next month. Um, fall 2021 data files will be shared in October 2022 and future data will be shared annually in August. So as you know, we mentioned, we're looking at annual data sharing. Just keep in mind, um, and you'll get an email about this, but just keep in mind that this is raw data and that um, JBS has completed preliminary data cleaning. So when you get the files, you know, just be aware that you'll need to perform additional data cleaning techniques and manipulation prior to using data. So. So, you know, just keep that. And also, you know, please use caution when you're interpreting results. So, um, you know, for more information, please reach out to your project officer, project officer um, to discuss um, how you intend to use um, the data that you see in those files. Um, and then for the 2021 PMHCA for, uh, awardees, um, raw survey data files, files will be shared annually in our August. So if there's any you know, changes in that timeline or that schedule, um, we'll work with JBS and keep you all updated about changes in timelines. Um, and then like I mentioned, please look for that email later this month or early next month. Um, and then just one more thing, um, the upcoming, an upcoming conference that might be of interest to you. There's an annual conference on advancing school mental health, October 13th and 14th. Um, it's being sponsored by the National Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland, I believe. Um, and so the, um, you know, if you're interested in attending that conference, you know, we recommend it. Um, we've had uh, presentations by the National Center and the School-Based Health Alliance, and they're two both great groups. So if you're interested, please consider registering. And for more information, we've provided the link to the registration page here. So um, those are PMHCA updates, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mona Lee for MDRBD updates. Thanks, Madhavi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mona Lee Belazir. I am one of the project officers for the Maternal Depression and Related Behavioral Disorders Program. And I have the privilege of just providing just a few updates to the MDRBD awardees. First, I um, just want to share about the supplemental funding that is available to the MDRBD awardees. So that information was shared via EHB on July 26th. And the due date for that is July 27 at 11.59 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. The purpose of this supplemental funding is to enhance data collection processes 
analyst and evaluate a review of program data. And so the activities there are listed are some of the activities that you can consider as you are putting together your supplemental, supplemental funding package. If you have any questions, if you're not seeing the information in the EHB, um, we did send notification that it is in there as well. But if you just so happen to have missed it, you did not know about it, please reach out to your product officer. If your product officer is Sansi Furman, I know that she's out until the 18th. So in the interim, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email, um, mbelazair at hersa.gov, but I'm sure you can find an email um, with my name somewhere for you all to reach out to me about the supplemental funding in the event that you have any questions. And finally, I just also want to remind the MDRBD awardees of the um, next MDRBD awarding meeting that's going to take place next week. Um, that is July 20th from 3 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you don't have that calendar notice, please let us know as well. But um, we, do, we have sent it out to the listserv and we also did share it with the point of contacts, the project directors or project managers that are affiliated with each state program. So if you happen to don't have that on your calendar or you missed it some way, please let us know or reach out to your project director or project manager for the program. That is it for me by way of announcements and updates for the MDRBD awardee program. I'll now turn it over back to Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we uh, appreciate the updates from both um, you, Mona Lee, as well as Mata B. And if anyone has any questions for them, you know, don't hesitate to put them in the chat and they can be addressed as they'll be here for the, um, for the whole meeting. So in terms of um, today's topic that we're talking about is uh, the program expansion pieces. And both programs, um, I'll say, have morphed maybe from original models that were, and we know that awardees are both looking at to address different levels of need through similar models, as well as um, being concerned about sustainability of programs over time once the HRSA uh, funding ends. Okay. I and could build a meeting at home. I'd come in. So that combination um, is. Uh, kind of driving, I'd say, some of the evolution of the programs. And we thought it would be helpful as you're looking at your programs to be able to think about it from two different levels. What is going on on a um, your national platform of different types of um, expansion activities, as well as um, thinking about measurement and outcomes and quality related to um, those programs as they um, expand. And that's something that John Strauss is going to take a look at and considerations uh, related to that. And then Massachusetts will present in terms of their um, approach to expansion. The, um, the other piece with this is that we know that um, uh, several awardees were interested in being able to present, but weren't able to um, actually present today. So as part of our discussion today, please, uh, for those programs and, and any other programs um, who would like to share um, their insights from expansion, don't hesitate to jump in um, as we move through this. So uh, next slide, please. Some examples of how um, different programs are extending their goals and objectives are related to geography and looking at um, it might just be from a starting off in a region, a particular region of um, a um, state or a territory or tribe and then expanding that uh, throughout. So please use the term you know, statewide as uh, being inclusive. Uh, language for uh, the different types of programs that do exist. And that being able to think about that, sometimes it's been necessitated by just being, uh, there's been interest in the program or as word has gotten out, or it was more difficult to engage with providers and um, establish the access programs in one part of the 
of an of a state or area and then being able to um, expand that made more sense and, and greater traction so it's really um, the the concept of geography has uh, been quite diverse across different programs and sometimes it's a planned expansion sometimes it's something that's morphed but i'd say overall um, awardees that have uh, looked at that geographic expansion have yielded some positive results related to them. So in terms of reach and um, use of the programs. In terms of setting, that's probably where some of the greatest differentiation that we've seen, in particular with the 2021 awardees, we're looking at um, emergency departments and um, school-based settings, and sometimes you know, there's some thought that is, you know, is a school-based setting considered um, quite an expansion by definition of how those programs are established. But for our purposes, uh, we're including that. And um, so that'll be interesting to learn from those awardees how that's going and some of the thinking behind that. Then in addition to the target populations, um, and that's where um, in particular, Massachusetts will be talking about the under six year old age and then also other awardees who have moved into adolescence and um, young adults or adults, as well as um, individuals with intellectual disabilities and the type of support that's needed uh, for those programs. Um, some programs have included uh, behavioral health and SUDs, you know, as part of that specifically addressing SUDs, and some awardees have expanded to include that as a more specific focus and um, some different types of support that's being provided. And then lastly, and this gets at some of the sustainability pieces in particular, is the expansion of to midwives, doulas, lay birth workers, substance abuse treatment providers, pediatricians, behavioral health providers. And the reason that the program participants um, is important or a consideration has to do with reimbursement and sometimes the ability to be reimbursed for providing those services. And uh, that's kind of a, a particular focus or being able to have a larger network of providers who can provide those support um, services for behavioral health services. So that's um, kind of an overview of the expansion examples. And for the next slide, please, if um, here gives a map of some of the different types of PMHCA program expansions that are occurring. So examples in California, New York, um, that's the uh, consultation school-based health centers, Chico saw a nation re reaching residential facilities for first American students focusing on the identification and treatment of ASD and suicide prevention. Connecticut also looking at the school based as well as expanding to that um, young adult population. And um, DC also school based, uh, Minnesota uh, with the LG, um, LQ, sorry, it should be LGBTQIA children and um, same with Vermont. And um, then the Medicaid population for both Vermont and Georgia and South Carolina focusing on the emergency rooms and uh, Wyoming on the school base. So you see kind of a range of the programs where say original cohort and awardees were focused on uh, primary care and on um, the pediatrician pediatric practices. Um, so next slide, please. So for MDRBD, there are four programs um, that we're looking at expansions. And you see with Florida, midwives, doulas, and the lay births, workers, Louisiana, the community mental health and substance use disorders treatment, and Rhode Island also expanding to the emergency departments um, at all the hospitals to help address the OUD. So that's kind of com combining the SUD uh, component with the type of um, setting, so the emergency department. And then Vermont um, also with the substance abuse screening uh, component and through some partnerships. So you see that community component um, uh, 
coming in as well. So those collaborations that we do look at in terms of the evaluation, we see that coming up here. So this, um, these few slides that I've gone over are designed to give a high level overview of the look of expansion and the approach across the programs as you're thinking about the application, whether it be reach or sustainability over time, some context for you. So I will now uh, turn it over to um, Dr. John Strauss. And I'll just take one moment yet to, I just want to introduce uh, Dr. Strauss for just a moment as well. And uh, for those of you who don't know, he's a primary care pediatrician and the founding director of the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Program known as MCPAP. MCPAP was the first statewide program developed to address the shortage of child psychiatrists. Um, Dr. Strauss was responsible for the expansion of MCPAP to include MCPAP for moms to address prenatal, perinatal depression, mental illness, and substance use, working in close collaboration with Nancy Byatt. Um, he is president of the National Network of Child Psychiatry Access Programs, a nonprofit dedicated to providing technical assistance and support to child psychiatry. We are honored to have him here and um, presenting to us today. We know that he has worked with many of the programs already, and um, we are uh, excited to have you here. So, Dr. Strauss. Thank you, Susan, for kind words. And hello, everybody. Uh, nice to be here. And uh, um, so, Susan very well talked about uh, all the different ways that specific programs are thinking about expansion. And I'm going to try and, and give you a, a brief, very high level sort of framework for thinking about expansion. I think it probably focuses a little more on the pediatric side than the, than the perinatal side, but uh, obviously there's a good connection between the two. And I hope we'll, we'll be, you'll, both groups will find it useful. Um, next slide, please. So as we think about expansion, I'm gonna put it into four groups. Sort of completing the build out of what I call basic one, and then expanding sort of basics two, which are the sort of between those two bullets are the, will be the sort of um, uh, areas that we saw as we started and really, uh, with the original model of Massachusetts where all the components we tried to include. And then um, um, the third bullet will be expanding out of the populations, as Susan has mentioned. And then the fourth is really are, are trying to begin to focus ju not just from the, you got to start with access, because if you don't have access, you don't have anything. But we need to move from access to the question of are the, are the, are, the folks we're helping are, is the uh, improvement in outcome and quality. So uh, next slide. So uh, when we look at basic one, um, where uh, uh, you may, uh, you're trying to enroll everybody in your region and uh, uh, or state, and that's always, there's always opportunities to improve that and engage the practices. Um, I think mo almost everybody has some kind of phone consultation line. And uh, um, there's always, there again, ways to make that, to improve that. Um, I think all folks are doing some kind of resource and referral work, um, including uh, uh, having some database where they can uh, have resources that will help people. In general, you start off probably with mostly mental health and uh, I forgot the health there and SUD resources, um, but uh, moving to community and school services um, are is an opportunity for expansion. And then the education side, um, there, there's a range from echoes and, and learning collaboratives to site visits and, and website and newsletter clinical guidelines. So all the kind of educational things that I think everybody is doing something of but again, there's always a, a ability to uh, expand those opportunities. Next slide. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so then um, these I've sort of set it into basic too, because from what I'm seeing that they're not all, you know, folks are at varying uh, places with these. And I'll start up in the upper right. I, I think that the, the uh, making sure that you uh, have the ability to have face-to-face -face or tele-video consultations is really critical. And I, I'll talk a little bit, I'm gonna do a whole separate slide on that, but keep that in mind. I think of all the things on this slide, that's probably the, the most important. Um, and as is sustainability, um, because we need to make sure that these programs will be sustainable. And if you want to expand, in general, you're going to need to be able to sustain what you now think of as your basic program and um, use supplemental money to do expanding. And I think as we see the Congress being willing to continue to fund our programs, um, this is going to get to be more, more of, a, of a model where you have a basic your basic program is sustainable, be funded, and you're using the HRSA money for piloting and expansion and trying new things. Um, so um, uh, another area that you wanna make sure that you're doing is that you're screening, that you have a real sc robust screening package that you're, you're using. All ages, all conditions, and again, this is oriented towards pediatrics, but it, it's true for the, perinatal side as well. Um, and in pediatrics, particularly making sure you're screening for postpartum depression, SUD, and trauma. And then um, uh, reaching all populations, um, the full population of your region or state. So that's all practice, obviously, uh, maybe expanded the geography. And um, I, I put school based health centers in this bucket because uh, in general, if they have a prescriber or someone who's um, a clin clinician, uh, they can be consulted like with any practice. And then finally, I think another area of expansion we're gonna be seeing more of is how you connect electronically with the, your practices and ability to do e-consults. Um, next slide. Just a, rem a reminder about face-to-face. -face. Uh, we've always found that we get much more participation from the providers if we, uh, by offering the ability to do face-to-face, -face. Not, not just sometimes to help with diagnosing or medication questions, but as our, our, one of our primary reasons is to be able to reassure the primary care provider or the OB uh, practice that the person they will be practice that uh, they can in fact manage this situation. And then second opinion and bridging, we're gonna follow, we're gonna talk a little bit later. And uh, keep in mind that uh, we like to always make sure there's a follow-up letter and uh, that these are billable services. So oftentimes in Massachusetts, we do, we do bill. And uh, so we're not depending upon that for our, within our funding for the sustain, sustaining of the program, but uh, that's a consideration uh, to allow that this to be a, uh, uh, to stay cost-effective. All right, next slide. And in just in terms of full population, I think I've talked to before about this a little bit, some metrics you can use that you wanna see 90, over 95% of the practice in your state or region enrolled. You want to see that uh, um, at least 80% of your practice are using it in, annually, and pediatricians, a good benchmark is 60% of pediatricians. And if you look at well child visits, you want more than 75% to have a formal behavioral health screen. Next slide. Um, so um, we're going to now, so that's sort of the basic components of most of that we've that I've talked about in terms of access programs. And next, uh, I'll cover the expansion to other populations. And the populations that are most, uh, you find this most useful are those where there's a primary care clinician knowledge deficit 
or the population of providers you're using have a knowledge deficit if it's like emergency room docs. Um, that uh, the person that you're consulting to can manage the case. Um, you don't wanna be suggesting something it can't do. Um, there needs to be in general a scarcity of specialists so that there's a need for the clinicians to be learning this stuff. And telephone consultation needs to work. Um, and uh, uh, if you have to lay on hands, if you need a physical exam, uh, you're not gonna be able to do this over the phone or the video. Next slide. So just to use uh, Massachusetts a little bit, we started, uh, uh, well, the program started, the basic program started in 2004, and we pretty much started with most of those original basic components. And, um, but in 2014, we expanded to perinatal and we added uh, SUD services in 2018, uh, specific SUD services, particularly to SUD providers. And then, um, in uh, 2019, we added uh, an adolescent substance use program, a ASAP MCPAP to uh, um, cover uh, teen substance use. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little, a little bit more about most of these as we go through. In 2019, we also added an adult program. I'm not gonna talk about that because Susan, I was interested you added adults there. I'm not sure, I'd be interested about how to comment whether adults are a legitimate expansion in terms of what Congress is allowing these programs to do. Um, and uh, so I'm not gonna talk about that, but it's been very successful uh, uh, helping uh, adult providers internists with uh, pa patients with uh, uh, addiction and chronic pain or acute pain issues. In 2020, we added uh, uh, an ASD program, uh, ASD ID program, and I'll talk about that. Last year, we've been dealing, we've added a school program, and we'll, I won't be talking, but uh, 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 Kate Roper will be talking about our early childhood HRSA-funded program that we just are beginning. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, beyond PCCs, beyond the primary care obstetric office. Next slide. Just quickly, you guys know this, but uh, perinatal depression is underdiagnosed and undertreated. It's a problem for one in seven pregnancies. Next slide. And just again for the pediatric, obviously the per perinatal folks know this, but 60% um, of women who develop postpartum depression are identified before delivery. So that's why there's been a huge focus on uh, what goes on in prenatal care and in the OB world. And, uh, um, th but 40% is, does occur after delivery. And that's where we as uh, doing PMHCA programs need to worry that the pediatricians are screening. Next slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, so just as you think about uh, if you're expanding, if you're a pediatric program, you're expanding perinatally, uh, par obviously partner with your local perinatal experts, particularly if there's an MD RBD program. Um, you want to promote pediatrics using, particularly you, we recommend the SWIC, the Survey of Wellbeing of Young Children, um, which has the embedded uh, Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale, which is the best known uh, screening tool for um, uh, postpartum depression. Um, there's uh, Lifeline for Moms uh, is always happy to have to give uh, folks looking to expand perinatally uh, help, and uh, we really encourage you to share operations between the programs because there's a lot of efficiency to be gained by that. So uh, next slide. Uh, here's some stuff on uh, McPat for Moms, which is now eight years old. But um, I think the only thing I'm going to focus on today is that 25% of we're touching each year, about 25% of the women who are estimated to have uh, mental health or SUD issues. I'm not sure, some of these slides 
something happened to the H there. Anyway, uh, next next slide, please. In terms of pediatric SUD, um, we want to, as you expand, you want to be screening and using a tool for SBIRT. Um, and uh, SBIRT is screening to brief intervention to referral and treatment. And uh, we, this, these slides got, uh, I will make sure we have a corrected version because somehow the screening tool is S2BI um, and um, um, it's, it's sort of supplanted what's been traditionally the craft um, as the most efficient uh, way to screen teens for substance use. And we've added to our, to our program uh, MDs who are SUED experts in teen substance use, and we've added virtual counseling. And uh, the, so that when calls come in on the pediatric line for, um, um, with an SUD concern, it goes to one of these uh, specialists. And um, we're finding that uh, uh, a lot of the concerns around uh, pediatric SUD are around uh, nicotine, vaping, marijuana use, which don't traditionally go to the sort of statewide substance use programs and uh, the virtual counseling and we're doing some group counseling really is work is has been a very valuable part of our program and we're using the specialists at Children's Hospital. Next slide. In terms of autism, I, I think that what what the um, one of our keys is that the person taking the call, and so we're able to take to triage calls to the specialist when that's appropriate, is uh, uh, is an ABA uh, um, clinician who's trained in management of of ASD and ID, so that um, they are able to do a video conference and observe the child's behavior. We have MD experts uh, uh, also available. And uh, currently in Massachusetts, it's just available for the crisis teams, but we really see a use to expand that to uh, all PCCs, particularly with our hope to help with uh, diagnosing toddlers who screen positive for ASD or recognized by their families. And um, the, uh, because you need a formal diagnosis in order to get usually to get insurance to pay for services. And that's often a barrier. Next slide. Schools. So schools are very, are, are complex uh, creatures, as you all know. So um, as I said before, um, you sort of have to look at what you're gonna be doing in the school. So school-based health centers in general, and we'd love to hear people of finding differently, can treat them pretty much like a primary care practice and should be enrolled and have the, the connection as any primary care practice would. Schools are often interested in crisis services, but that's probably not a PMHC role. Um, School systems are increasingly focusing on what kind of curriculum and how to help teachers manage behavior in the classroom. And this may be a little editorializing, but I think that that's probably not a good role for PMHCA. It's very political, as you know. And we, I think we, as programs, we wanna stay very neutral in our advice and our approach. And if we get um, too, uh, this is something, you know, You've obviously all heard of all the pressure from parents to be in control of what happens in terms of these, these issues with their kids. So, but certainly as on an individual level, there'll be people in, the, in your program that'll probably contribute. Another uh, issue with the schools is staff consultation education. And uh, um, we certainly can provide that. Um, and um, in Massachusetts, we have, the last year we've been doing that in one region of our state. And what we have found is that the nurses and the behavioral folks in the school love it, but it becomes very frustrating if you don't have any ability to get direct service. Um, you can say, well, call your primary, you know, go to the primary care office and they can call uh, 
the, the, the program, but um, that's not really what the school wants to hear. So um, it really comes down to thinking a little bit about uh, um, direct services. And um, um, some schools don't need it because they have lots of mental health uh, folks in the school. Some schools have contracted oftentimes with one of your institutions, the institutions that are in the PMHCA program um, for specific services, and that's great. But the real focus, I think, is on the schools that have not inadequate mental health services. And um, um, I'll refer you to the uh, Texas program called TCHAT, Ch Texas Child Health Through Telemedicine. And uh, um, it's, uh, it, it's really a uh, excellent uh, program and it may be a good subject for um, a future discussion. Next slide. And I just said, uh, we, we have been doing this in one region of the state. We've actually put it on pause because we, we we're found some frustrations that we weren't able to, to provide the direct service and we're trying to rethink it at the moment. Next slide. I won't, we're gonna, Kate will cover all this and, um, in our discussion, but when you get your slides, at least you'll, you'll have this there. And next, next slide. And then to think a little bit about beyond primary care. Uh, and in this way, I, I am uh, treating obstetrics and as a primary care specialty as well. Um, emergency services you've heard about. Um, we offer emergency services. We have got very little take up because most of the problem in the emergency room is around disposition. And unfortunately, consultation doesn't help much with that. Um, but I think in some areas, you might be able to help with referrals because we don't want someone leaving the emergency room without a good follow-up. Um, I think we can help where there are clinician deserts. Uh, actually, these days, almost everywhere, there's not enough clinicians. But um, I would refer you to the Michigan model where they've spread uh, the program pace for behavioral health clinicians to be throughout the state. It really helps in the rural areas, particularly. I, I think uh, uh, we're going to be increasingly supporting. Uh, these programs are set up to, to primarily help primary care with the mild and moderate kinds of problems that they need to be managing in primary care. But I think we're going to increasingly be able to help with more complex youth, particularly in rural areas where there's no child psychiatry. And um, in urban areas where families may be frustrated with uh, how they're, with what's happening for their kid, uh, we can offer a second opinion. And then we can do what we call bridging, where uh, you uh, um, are trying to help the PCC who is, uh, has on their hands a kid who just got out of the hospital and doesn't have a follow-up in the near future, or um, a kid who should be getting into uh, uh, higher level care, um, should be getting to see a psychiatrist but can't get there quickly, we can actually do a fairly, we can do a one-time consult and give some advice to, so that the primary care office can begin some kind of treatment. And then uh, just, uh, we always want new ideas of other things we can do and uh, uh, let us know at the National Network. We'd be happy to uh, let you talk about an idea that you have. So. Um, I think that's all that all I have. Next slide. Um, just to to oh I'm sorry, I was gonna let me, five a few more minutes. I talk about it from expanding from access to outcome. Um, so as I said, how do we know children are getting better? Well, um, we want to be looking at the population. How are those how are kids doing? So are you paying attention to at the state level or getting your health plans in your area to look at uh, what's happening in terms of their um, tracking of behavioral health. And uh, uh, things like percent kids being screened, percent positive, percent in treatment, and percent remission in six months. There are now good HEDIS measures for these, and um, you can be, be applying them at 
the state or the health plan level or even at the practice level. Um, we're often the eyes and ears for what's happening in the in your region and ter or state in terms of how what what are the system issues are there not where are there not enough clinicians where are there services uh, uh, where are people leaving the hospital without a good discharge plans so how do you build how do you incorporate yourself into the uh, mental health substance use system so you your advice you you can feed back your your on the ground experience. And then equity and then promotion of collaborative care. So next slide. In terms of equity, 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 uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, you're measuring your race and ethnicity and your reporting and that um, your outcomes are equitable. Um, and you're discussing with staff, you're including ex an expert on your team, perhaps. Um, you're updating your materials with this in mind. You're conducting webinars around equity issues, and uh, um, you're including trauma and equity in how you do your consults. Next slide. Collaborative care. I hope folks know about collaborative care. If you're not, a, it, it the collaborative care model came out of the University of Washington. It's uh, uh, on the previous slide, I had a, ha, had a link to it, to the Ames Institute, has lots of information. It's really the best uh, way of knowing that uh, at a practice level that care is, that your patients are getting better. Um, and it includes a number of different components. Uh, just to summarize, you're, you need to be uh, using uh, uh, evidence-based workflow you need to, you should have team care with which includes an embedded behavioral health clinician or care coordinator. You're measuring your care, so you're treating to a measured outcome, such as a PHQ-9. You're tracking, you have a registry, you're tracking your, like, your patients. And using your P PMHCA or CPAP to uh, when you're stuck. And in fact, we can begin to uh, do proactive, let's say monthly meetings to go over practices registry. And then uh, the practice is holding itself accountable uh, on a yearly basis to uh, um, its outcomes. Next slide. I have two slides. You can slip to the next one. Two slides on, on our adult program, which you can look at your leisure. And then finally, um, uh, you'll get my contact info if you last slide if you need it. So I think I've uh, kept a schedule pretty much. And uh, um, w w during the Q and A time, it'd be great to hear um, if uh, folks have other th ideas or directions they're they're going. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, John. It's always just uh, wonderful to you know, have you present. I, I know that there'll be some questions at the end. Um, and now if we um, could have next slide, please. And I'm going to introduce uh, Kate Roper. And she is the Director of Early Childhood Services in the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Division of Pregnancy, Infancy, and Early Childhood. Ms. Roper is the Principal Investigator for the PMHCA project, also known as MCPAP for Early Childhood. She previously was PI for two SAMHSA project launch grants that integrated teams of infant and early childhood mental health clinicians and family partners in pediatric primary care. Thank you, Kate, for joining us. Thanks, Susan. I'm very excited to be here. I will warn you that I was having some bandwidth issues, so hopefully those have gone away. Um, so um, you can go to the next slide. And I apologize, there's a few things on the slides that um, you already know, like how much the grant is for, but um, we had to use pre-approved slides for this because it was a short-term turnaround. Um, so I wanted to say that when we first heard about this grant opportunity, we were really excited um, to reach out to Dr. Strauss and team um, to raise the idea of doing an early childhood expansion. It's been something that was on our radar for a long time, and we had worked with Dr. Strauss previously on um, an, another attempt to do some early childhood work with McPath. Um, so we um, put our 
proposal together rather quickly. Um, and so our goal is to really enhance the early childhood mental health capacity of MCPAP um, in centering family engagement and equity. Um, so to date, we have established and trained a MCPAP for early childhood team that includes a part-time psychiatrist and a full-time early childhood mental health clinician who have already started providing consultation to primary care practices. Um, we are in the process of planning um, training and case consultation using the ECHO model to enable primary care provider team to support the behavioral health needs and wellness of children under six and um, are beginning to offer enhanced tools and resources as well as linkage to the early childhood and family support system. Uh, one of the tools that we are basing a lot of our work on is a tool called the pyramid model um, to promote social emotional competence in infants and young children. Uh, this is a model that was developed with Head Start funding for Head Start and early education and care programs initially, um, but has expanded to <coughs> family support um, uh, groups and tools, as well as home visiting and early intervention. And we had previously under our SAMHSA grant adapted it to primary care and are wanting to take it to the next level. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we have an amazing team. Um, Larissa Mendez Pinato, our project director, was unfortunately not able to join us today, but she and I worked together on the project launch integration grant for 10 years. Um, and um, we're really excited to um, continue this work um, that's going to help us do some similar things. Uh, we have Roxanne Hope Chandler as our early childhood systems coordinator for family engagement and training. Uh, she's a parent with lived experience with children with disabilities and behavioral health concerns um, and is a leader in racial equity in um, the Department of Public Health. And the McPAP team um, also has a stellar team. Um, Dr. Yale DeVere is the um, medical director um, of the central region of McPAP hub and the vice chair and director of child and adolescent psychiatry in UMass Chan Medical School. Um, Dr. Strauss, you have already heard from. Um, and then the team that we hired for the project, um, Carolina Clark is the social worker, the early childhood behavioral health clinician. And um, we're really excited that she was previously one of the launch integrated clinicians um, and really was able to take an advantage of all the extended training that we provided during that time. Um, so we really didn't have to do much additional training for her. Um, Carol Lindquist is the early childhood and child and adolescent psychiatrist at a point one FTE. And the program coordinator is in the process of being hired. We also partner really closely with um, two of the other state agencies, the Department of Mental Health, which is the home for the regular MCPAP project, as well as MCPAP for moms and Mass Health, our Medicaid agency, which um, it, uh, provides the funding and support for our MCPAP for ASD and ID. Um, and then our other major support is our Young Children's Council. Um, that is the agency, um, the group that supports um, advice on all our early childhood mental health and early childhood systems grant. We've worked really hard over the last few years to make that group um, bring a strong family voice to all um, project design and implementation, as well as a racial equity lens. Next slide, please. Um, as um, John and uh, Susan were referring, um, we are starting this project in two regions of the state and then moving to, um, statewide. Uh, we chose Western and Central Mass um, for a couple of reasons. One, it was the um, regions with the highest number of um, children under six already being seen. Um, secondly, there's the most rural um, practices in those um, set parts of the state and are often neglected when grant opportunities come around. And finally, um, Dr. DeVere, the medical director, um, had a strong interest in early childhood and was a champion for that. Um, so we knew we could work really well together. Um, our plan is to really build the capacity of the practices in those regions of the state through the echoes that we are going to be doing, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and through the consultation that they're receiving from Carolina and Cara. And then um, to um, hopefully they will need less support and that our um, consultation team can start taking calls from other parts of the state. Um, our plan B is to expand into other consultation teams um, 
and looking at some other um, sustainable sources of funding. As John has described, um, the CAP has worked very well and very closely with the legislature in the state um, to support um, various expansions of MCAP, and, and that is something that is on our radar screen. Next slide, please. So um, the MCAP, um, basic MCAP model is depicted here in um, the dark blue color. Um, it's similar to many of your models. Um, the child and family or youth are supported by the pediatric practices, um, and they receive support from MCAP. Um, um, consultation with the psychiatrist, um, and if necessary, face-to-face uh, -face consultation. And care coordination if needed, um, and again, if necessary, um, direct consultation to the parent via phone and support to contact um, uh, partners um, and uh, referral sources. Um, for our MCAP for early childhood, we've adopted some system enhancements. So we're beginning um, with talking about the ECHO training for the pediatric champion clinics. Um, we decided we really wanted to, to do two different kinds of ECHOs. Um, one was you know, more traditional, the um, this one on the right is um, for the pediatrician champions. Um, and that ECHO will be led by Dr. DeVere to do um, uh, focus on the most commonly presenting early childhood mental health issues um, to MCAP and to the practices. Um, for the echo that my team will lead is going to be focused um, for integrated behavioral health clinicians and family partners. And one of the things that's happening in our state um, is that um, our, our Medicaid agency has already been involved in doing um, a 1115 waiver focused on value-based payment with the accountable care organizations. And in the new iteration of the waiver that um, has not been approved quite yet, um, that will be extended to integrated behavioral health care teams in pediatrics um, through subcapitation. Um, so we really want to um, build towards that and knowing that also uh, many of the practices already have integrated teams that may not be specifically focused on the youngest children. So this um, ECHO will really build on the pyramid model, um, the pyramid in primary care, we call it. Um, and as most ECHOs, there'll be the brief didactics and the case consultation. And we're also developing a toolkit using many of the free um, online materials that um, the pyramid provides in multiple languages um, that are very um, useful for working with families. Um, they may be a, a social story that talks about, now I'm going to preschool and helps the child prepare for that. Um, emotion um, faces and um, emotional literacy tools, uh, problem solving tools. Um, there's really a, a lot of wonderful materials. So then in addition to the two echoes, um, uh, our family um, support consultant will be consulting both to the MCAP team as well as um, participating as one of the hub members for both of the echoes um, to ensure that family voice is really well represented in all the um, presentations and consultations. Um, she's also already begun to um, expand the referral resources that MCAP um, already has available um, to go beyond um, behavioral health resources to family support groups um, and also to linkages to child care and public preschools that are implementing the pyramid model to fidelity. Um, since many of the referrals are for children who are being expelled from preschool and that the um, programs that are implementing the pyramid model um, have really had a very good track record with being able to maintain children in um, their placements. Um, the pyramid and primary care toolkit that we're developing and we'll pilot with the ECHO teams um, will then also be um, shared statewide to the 500 pediatric practices in the state. And then the additional um, program enhancements are with our, um, the clinical consultation team. So, um, uh, we started with sort of a soft start um, when calls came in for kids under six, they were um, triaged to our early childhood specialist, Carolina. And um, the number of cases had, um, of kids under six has increased from about 40 a month to about 60 a month, and, and she's seeing about 75% of those. Um, and then if necessary, she's able to provide face-to-face -face consultation 
um, to do a multi-session evaluation um, using the diagnostic tool that is specific to infants and young children, um, known as the DC-0-5, or the Diagnostic Classification for Infancy and Early Childhood. And I'll put a link to the chat in the chat to that and the pyramid model when I'm not speaking. Um, and also to be able to do interim psychotherapy. Um, one thing I just want to say here while we're on this slide is to talk a little bit about our long term vision for this project that we know we're coming in during the behavioral health crisis and that the calls we are getting are, are pretty much at a crisis level. Um, some of the calls Calvernie uh, is taking are from pediatricians who are wanting a consult around the medications that they're prescribing to very young children for ADHD, sometimes with, without a diagnosis ever having happened yet, um, and finding that the medication isn't working. Um, so that's one issue we're hearing a lot of. We're hearing about um, the need for autism um, uh, evaluations and the difficulty in waiting for that, and in particular in finding um, somebody who has the capacity to do a differential diagnosis for a young child, taking into account the things that um, the diagnostic tool we talked about um, does in looking at relational issues, um, developmental issues, trauma, um, psychosocial stressors, and health issues, as well as clinical diagnoses. Um, and, um, and then uh, trauma is a huge issue in kids in foster care. So those are some of the major issues that we're seeing. Uh, next slide. So um, as I mentioned that we're doing the two echoes, we are just starting to recruit um, and really trying to um, use these to enhance the knowledge, skills, and self-efficacy for the um, PCPs and their integrated care teams um, to serve children under six in the practice. Um, the whole idea of going upstream is so critical now when we're seeing so many um, children really being challenged with um, suicidal ideation, with um, um, boarding. And, you know, as we see that happening to younger and younger children, we really want to help practices to start working um, in more in the prevention and promotion of um, I think most of you are probably familiar with the ECHO model, the telementory platform uh, that uses video conferencing, um, collecting experts with the primary care teams, um, fostering it all, teach and all learn. Um, our team is going to include myself and um, our family um, engagement consultant, as well as a, a, a former uh, launch integrated clinician. Um, and we're also going to be bringing in specialists from the community that work in um, family support. I think um, Kate, just, okay, Kate, we just lost you for a moment there. So um, if you could just repeat what you said. Oh, just am I back? Bit. Yep, you're back. I think, think we might have lost you again. Okay. I, while we're waiting. Oh, oh go ahead. Sorry about that. I had my iPad as a backup and that. Uh, yes. So um, tell me where you lost me. The last point that you were making, um, I think. Uh, oh, that, that, oh, so 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 we're going to include on our um, hub teams um, experts from other sectors um, to um, to help make those connections to mental health consultation and childcare programs to help sustain kids who are being suspended or expelled um, to early intervention. Um, uh, to um, programs that are implementing the pyramid model and to family support programs. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a little bit more information on the two ECHOs um, and, and who's being invited um, to join, as I mentioned, um, pediatricians and family practice um, physicians, um, APRNs, physicians assistants and nurses would be invited to the um, 
the echo on common early childhood mental health concerns and um, Dr. Demir and her team will be bringing in um, experts on various topics such as ADD and sleep disorders. Um, our focus on positive behavior support um, is for social workers and LMHC, psychologists, family partners and community health workers. Next slide please. Uh, this is um, our contact information and next slide and how to get in touch with our Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And I think that's it for me. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, um, Kate and uh, Dr. Strauss. Really appreciate the, uh, the um, all the insights that you shared here. In terms of next steps, what we have is the opportunity to ask questions. You can, um, as uh, we said, that um, you can um, raise your hand and we can unmute uh, you or you can put your your question directly into the chat and then uh, we can cover those things. I, I do have a couple questions in the meantime while um, you're thinking about your questions that I wanted to ask. I'm going to start with Kate, in terms of um, you mentioned how you work so closely with the legislature to expand your program, can you talk a little bit more in detail about what that entails and you know, how long it takes in the process? Just any insights about na navigating the legislature? Yeah. So um, let me just say that I am an employee of the State Department of Public Health. And so we are actually enjoined from working with the legislature. Um, so, um, so John really needs to answer that question okay. um, that because you know it's the executive branch versus the legislative branch. Yes. Okay. We'll turn it to John then. Thank you. Okay, um, Susan. It, it takes time. Um, we um, were lucky at way back at the beginning when we were first dreaming up McPap. Um, there was a already the American Academy, the local state chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the local chapter of the child psychiatrist, ACAP, um, had already formed a joint mental health task force to address issues around the inadequacy of uh, getting help with for, for, around behavioral health issues with the kids in their practice. And so that group, which had pediatricians and some state legislators and some agency folks, state agency folks and insurers, all were uh, part of the original group that supported uh, the creation of MCPAP. So I think the, the first thing is to get a stakeholder group that uh, of advocates that can speak for, and oh, I, I should say, and the task force had parent representation, which is probably the most important, um, so that they could, the group could speak to the legislature about the importance of um, creating a program or supporting a program such as this. Um, since then, um, there's also become a, uh, a couple, a, a, a more formal lobbying group called the Ch Children's Mental Health Campaign and uh, that's a consortium of lots of uh, pediatric uh, uh, child serving groups. And uh, um, they have become, I guess, the main uh, supporter. So I think it's, uh, and we, we each year uh, meet with them and try and figure out what are our, gonna be our asks this year for, to the legislature. Um, and uh, um, it's, uh, uh, I think that, that kind of cooperative relationship um, is what's key to, to moving things along. Okay, thank you very much. And for all the different expansions that you've done, have you know the mom McPat for moms and all that has that? Have you engaged uh, different um, you know with legislative activities around that, or is this newer for the pediatric um, expansion? No, I think on in each case. Well, McPat for Moms actually started with a uh, um, state model, in a SIM grant, a state innovation model grant, that federal grant um, mm -hmm. that uh, the state had, and we got a little piece of it. Um, but then th that was only uh, began early, and then we immediately went to ask the legislature for to build it in to make it sustainable. So. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, I think that the idea that, and again, as I said before, you, the nice thing about having HRSA funding is not to rely on it for the next 10 years, but to think of it as a way of advancing your program and uh, uh, building in the sustainability for what you've already shown works and then using uh, uh, pilot money, grant money for uh, developing new avenues. Okay. Thank you very much. That, that's very helpful. Um, in terms of, I'll just put it, the question out to any other programs that have uh, successfully worked with the legislature or um, have had challenges working with the legislature that might be helpful to discuss here. So you know, please put your comments in the chat and then we can um, un, uh cover you know that. Um, I guess my next question is, I'll see, I'll let Kate and John, you decide, you know, how best, uh, who best to respond, but was, uh, Kate, when you were talking, it made me think about how, um, uh, you know, could the different age groups, so in, in your case, as you've expanded to early childhood, be included from the start? You know, is that something that the programs could support if that's, if, you know, that, or does it really need to be that specialized to doing chunks? Well, I, I'll start and then I think John should finish. You know, MCAP has always served birth to 18, at least. Um, he can finish that. Actually, 20, whatever, as long as you're in a pediatric practice here, doesn't matter how old you are. <laughs> so, so I think the, the focus on um, birth to six is just that, you know, um, even many clinicians really don't have expertise in serving that population and sort of have a, a, a deeper understanding of sort of the dyadic nature of the work that we're really working with um, the child, the parent, and the relationship between the two, which, you know, really all, all clinical work with um, uh, youth and uh, children and families uh, should have that approach. But I think that understanding of infant and early childhood mental health, which is in some ways is a, is a very new field compared to a lot of other pieces of behavioral health. Um, so um, with a lot of work that's been done in the last 20 years around, you know, even uh, developing a diagnostic classification specifically to how um, certain conditions present differently in, in very young children. It, it was really just to bring that focus um, forward. And, and really, in, you know, to really move upstream in this work, to really do the early prevention and um, parenting support that hopefully will help ameliorate problems, um, as, as one of our colleagues talks about, to stop little problems from becoming bigger problems further on. So there is kind of an, uh, there, there is the opportunity, but when it's needing for the specialty components, it might depend what the program can afford and then looking at expansion. And I think from Massachusetts lens, that was also expanding to a more rural parts of the state um, to the Western part, correct? Um, well, uh, there already was McPap in those parts of the state, um, but I think in, in deciding where we were gonna, uh, have this pilot. Um, we selected that um, those areas, um, partly because there were there were more robust services available in the Boston area. Yes. It's fairly typical of most things in Massachusetts. Right. Uh, and, right. and John, I, you know, this is and Susan. I I think that w what yeah, there's always exceptions, but in general, the programs are going to start with folks who, the consultants, you only have so much resource to buy consultants, they're expensive. And uh, you're gonna start with the generalists. So you're gonna start with the child psychiatrist who can answer the majority of the problems that may come that way. And um, that's gonna be the ADHD, the depression, the anxiety, the substance use. Mm -hmm. And even the substance use, a lot of the general child psychiatrist is not gonna be totally they're not doing that that much. So they don't feel as comfortable. So I think that the issue is, is you may be lucky that you get somebody on your team who has that expertise as we do with Yale, but um, you got to start with, with, the, with people who can cover the majority of, your, of the kinds of calls you're going to get. And then you can add in, and sometimes you can add it in without 
as a basic member of the team, and sometimes you need to add it in a specialist. And I, I think in this case, it's not the expertise is not as at the position level. It's adding the that uh, Carolina, who's our behavioral health clinician, with that expertise, because in fact our goal is medication in general should not be used in this population. And uh, if you consulting too often with the doctor, you're going to get a medication. So it's nice to to be able to have that resource that is going to think of how to how to help the family without resorting to medication. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, John, I have another question for you on slide 15 of your presentation. Um, you talked about the um, metrics that Massachusetts uses of 95% of practices in the state or region are enrolled, 80% annual usage by practices, 60% of pediat pediatricians with annual usage, 75% well child visits with behavioral health screening. Um, how did Massachusetts is, is these are the metrics that Massachusetts uses, correct? In terms yeah. of yeah, that's the successful program. I know a number of awardees um, you know, are really working to engage the providers and practices. Um, how does how does Massachusetts achieve those numbers and how and how are those determined determined? Um, the achievement is it took time. I mean, it took, I don't think we, it took close to four years before we thought we had that over 95% practices enrolled. Um, the, uh, uh, knowing the denominator is actually <laughs> not easy uh, in most states. There are a few states actually that have a, uh, can do it pretty easily, but most states, it's not an easy task to get a list of all the practices and it's just um, boots on the ground using Google and and medical society, anywhere you can do to get a list of, of practices. Um, it's, uh, uh, we, we really just Google town by town to make sure we had all the practices. And um, then you, you still maintain that, is that correct? Is that, that's yes. kind of, yeah. You're, metric to keep that and yeah. is that what you're using to report to the legislature or is that just kind of you you if your threshold drops below 60 percent of pediatrician usage is there something that you do to help engage those pediatricians again right. we do track on a quarterly basis the utilization at the practice level and on an annual basis at the provider level and we will reach out to practice and providers who are at, haven't called us recently and uh, um, brainstorm with them. Sometimes it's because they've got an in-house resource mm -hmm. and don't need us. Um, sometimes it's because they just, we our education and the consultation they've done has re reached a level that they don't, they, they just haven't had a, an unusual case. I mean, I think it, it varies a little now because we've been doing this for so long that uh, there's some folks that, have been, that uh, are awful good at doing the, this work. Right. And that's really a change. It doesn't happen overnight, it takes time. I think a lot of docs when we started, a lot of uh, nurse practitioners, whoever, uh, did not think that this was something they wanted to do. And uh, um, I guess the good and the bad news is that they can't avoid it now. It's too much of a, there's just no way you can have a pediatric practice without yeah. dealing with behavioral health. Oh, that, that makes sense. Um, I, there's a question in the chat that has, um, from Julie Yannick is, uh, has McPAP started using HEDIS or other quantitative measures to examine the impact of the program on patient outcomes? If so, what are the findings? Uh, I wish I could say yes to that. I don't think the the uh, health plans are getting uh, the, the practice and the health plans need have a long way to go because they need to use their electronic medical record to really create those measures. And though NCQA has put out the measures, they're still not very well adapt being a, they haven't been widely adopted. So um, the state is actually holding the ACOs to um, the Medicaid ACOs to um, the depression measure, 
we'll see how I haven't seen any we haven't seen any data yet how that that's coming but it should be there in the next I would say a couple of years and uh, um, we just are encouraging practices to do it but there are very few practices that uh, um, this is a this is a more national problem but it it, it ought to be just a a part of uh, most so many practices there are only a couple medical record systems that most practices are using and these quality measures ought to be automatic but the let the the uh, record you know the emr companies are charging money for it and a lot of people aren't paying right right yeah thank you um and if anyone else is using um the uh any HEDIS measures or quantitative measures to track patient outcomes if you could either tell your project officer put it in the chat we'll uh, track that as well um there's a question Susan, from Jeff. so oh. uh, one thing to say is that one of the good one outcome measure is screening and that can be done that you should really be working with your state to do um Massachusetts is, is collecting that uh, on, the, on the Medicaid side, the public sector side, and we can report state data about that. And that's really important. If you're not screening, you're not gonna be finding a number of these kids that ought to be, that people ought to be calling. And the same is true. They've had more trouble on the perinatal side uh, collecting that screening is happening because of the global billing of uh, OB care, but it's, uh, um, I think working towards how you can use, how you making sure that the insurers are using a screening code to determine that screening is going on. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then want to, um, yep, so, uh, Julie responded very true regarding screening. Thank you. Um, and then Jen uh, Fowl made a comment here for SED ex expertise um, that they have uh, historically used the resources and staff from the regional ATTC, the Addiction Technology Transfer S Center, as ECHO and conference presenters. They are part of a SAMHSA grant. They can also help clinics implement the SBIRT process and assist schools in implementing um, an SBIRT process. So I think, yeah, those um, ATTCs and that extensive piece provides um, uh, a lot of very helpful information uh, to address substance use disorders. Uh, having worked on uh, expert evaluations and technical assistance for uh, for 15 years or so. So um, thank you, Jim. Appreciate you sharing that. Um, so any other comments or questions at this point? Susan, I had one uh, answer, uh, thought about in terms, I think it was Julie who asked about the quantitative measures. Even though the it's going to be a little while before we get that on a practice or say nothing of a state level, but one thing you can do is with each consult, make sure you're promoting that. So um, every time you have a consult, there should be well, what? How are you going to know whether what we're talking about works? So what measure you're going to use, and when are you going to do it? And call me back if the measure hasn't gotten better. So if it's a PHQ-9, the score should go down and you can talk about how much. And if it isn't that down in a month, you, I want to call back. And, uh, and so you can set the stand, you can be teaching the practices and then they start putting it in their record system. And then they maybe think about a registry, but you're, you can be driving that process by your consultations. Okay. Okay, well, thank, thank you, John. Really appreciate the additional comments. And uh, thank you uh, both Kate and John for being with us today. Really appreciate that. And um, if I uh, just go to the last slide here, want to first of all, thank everyone for attending today. Um, there is a um, link that's going to be put into the feedback uh, to, for you to provide feedback on the webinar. So we appreciate that. We actually look at that and um, work to apply it to future webinars and also provide a summary uh, to HRSA so um, they can um, use that. So we, we definitely use the feedback that's provided. And uh, thank you all for attending today. Have a great rest of the day.